tonight, this evening, this morning, if you're watching, you know, on the network, um, we're going to talk about the big picture. We're going to talk about the final miracle that Jesus did. Um, when we look at the miracles of Jesus, and we did a series, what, a year ago maybe now? About some of the miracles. We didn't cover all of them, but we, we looked at a big chunk of the miracles, and, and the biggest thing that we have to realize is every miracle that Jesus performed, there was a big picture. The miracle was just a piece of it. The miracle wasn't the big picture. The miracle was um, the attention getter. It was the, you know, the headline, if you will. <laughs> but it wasn't the whole idea. It wasn't the big picture. And the problem when we focus on miracles is we zoom in on the miracle. We focus on who walked on water. We focused on why he walked on water. We focus on who healed the leper. We focus on who got the, the coin out of the fish's mouth. And we focus on the miracle itself. The problem with that is we tend to overlook the message in the miracle. Um, Jesus never performed a miracle that didn't have a message. He didn't just walk around doing stuff because he could. That wasn't the point of healing people. That wasn't the point of um, freeing people from possession. That wasn't the point of doing the miracles that he did. It's never been the point of doing the miracles that he did. There was a, there's a message and there's a point. And the point we tend to lose because we just focus on the miracle. Only those uh, that are present get to see the miracle, right? So if, if, if I, Leslie broke her arm and then I healed it, all of us here would see that. Nobody else sees the miracle. Now all of us would run around and talk about it. We'd tell our friends, we'd tell the newspaper, the TV would come. We'd be able to tell people about it. But only people there benefit from the miracle, right? The only people there see the power, feel the power even, of the miracle. But in a message, you don't have to be present to get it. You don't have to be present to have firsthand knowledge of what that's about, why it's important, and who to share it to. So the message is as important as the miracle. Jesus addressed everything. Lots of times um, people say, well, everything's not in the Bible. Like, it doesn't say if you should watch TV. It doesn't say if you should, because those things aren't in the Bible. And I'm like, no, but the Bible very clearly tells us how we should spend our time. It very clearly tells us the things we should be thinking on. It very clearly tells us, and so if, if you're watching TV to the point that you're not doing those things, you need to cut back on TV a little bit. It doesn't have to be black and white. Jesus very much addresses everything. Sometimes he does it through parables. Sometimes he did it um, just through conversation. You know, there were times when he looked at the disciples and he's like, ye of little faith, are you still not getting this? <laughs> so it's just in talks. He addressed things, and of course, sometimes through miracles. So, we're going to look at the final miracle in the scriptures. It's going to be in Luke 22, 49 through 51. It's also found in John, but we're just using Luke because Luke's my favorite. <laughs> well, you can find it in, in uh, the latter chapters of John as well. Uh, Luke 22, 49 through 51. When those around him saw what was going to happen, um, they have, the soldiers, Judas has kissed Jesus and let the soldiers know this is the one. So, they're getting ready to, to take him. That's where we're at. So when those around him saw what was going to happen, they asked, Lord, should we strike with the sword? Then one of them struck the high priest's servant and cut his, off his right ear. Jesus responded, no more of this. And touching his ear, he healed him. The last time Jesus would heal anyone in his moral body, in his life, would be a soldier sent to arrest him. The last time he gave a blessing in this mortal life, would be to someone who was there to kill him. There's a message in that. There's a huge message to that. The last people to witness, to be present for the miracle of the Savior of the world were the soldiers sent to arrest him because the disciples ran. Remember? They got chickened out. They, they got scared. They chopped off the ear. Jesus was like, cut it out, and they ran. <laughs> So the only people that got to see the final miracle and that were receiving the miracle were the people that weren't there to appreciate him. They weren't there to worship him. They weren't there to um, learn about him. They weren't there to learn about their own faith. They were there to end Jesus. The last documentation of a miracle in the Gospels by Jesus would be written by those that abandoned him. The very last miracle we get is in John and it's in Luke and neither one of them stuck around. So we only get the story of the final miracle because those that abandoned Jesus are the ones that relate that story. There are a few of the miracles that are related in secular writings. Jesse, this is a uh, historian that I rely on heavily, and he remarks about miracles. But the final miracle is written by people who loved him, who lived with him for three years, and abandoned him when it got hard, when it got scary, and when it got tough. The conditions for the final miracle are not like any 
of the other conditions for all of the other miracles. Because for all the other miracles, he had some disciples with him. For all the other miracles, he had people with faith believing he could do it, right? For all the other miracles, it was a setting that was kind of great. You know, it was kind of easy to do a miracle in that setting. There is great significance in the final miracle because it's different from all of the rest. And it's different in the way of who got it, who saw it, and then who wrote about it. It's different from all of the other miracles. Jesus chooses a miracle to demonstrate his last chance to address the disciples. That he knew this is it. I'm, go, I'm getting arrested. I'm about to get beat. I'm about to get strung up. This is it. And we know Jesus knew this was it because scripture says when he was praying right before then, he begged God not to make him do it. Lord, let this cup pass out and do it. He was scared and he didn't want to do it and his friends left him. We've all been probably in something similar. And so instead of saying, I can't believe y'all have abandoned me, instead of moaning to the, the soldiers, you know, wait, let me call my mama, instead of doing any of this, he said, one more time, I've got to try to get my point across. And he used a miracle. It was more than a supernatural healing for us to wax and wane about the greatness of Jesus. It was a message. And these are the revelations we're supposed to be receiving out of that final miracle. The first is Jesus heals the offender. Peter thought he was protecting Jesus. I identify with Peter. I, I tend to get riled before I listen. <laughs> and Peter's like, I'll kill him, Lord. Watch him. He just chops the dude's ear off. <laughs> um, Jesus doesn't, this guy, the soldier, is going to arrest him. That's the point. This guy is pointing him out. This guy is recording it so that the high priests know what's going on. They, they want to bring him up on as many charges as they can get. So they're definitely watching what he says and what he does and how he moves. And if the disciples do attack, you know, they're... They're going to keep everything because when he goes on trial, we know they have a list of lies, right? Scripture tells us about people that just came up with stories to testify against Jesus. So they're definitely watching to see what they can talk about. And Jesus heals that guy. It said it was the high priest's servant, which means he probably wasn't a soldier. He was the guy writing everything down. He was the guy going to rat him out. He was the guy going to tell everybody and put, he was the... Fox News slash NBS, and, well, I don't know. The news stations, you know, some of them are biased to the left and some are biased to the right. They're both reporting the same story, but it's according to how they want you to see it. That's what this little servant guy was doing. He was going to say what happened, but he was definitely going to spin it so that Jesus, you know, was, was going to be found guilty of things. And that's the guy. Jesus is like, you deserve to have a right ear. <laughs> and he heals it and gives it back to him. The last person we would offer our last wish to would be the one responsible for our own death. If we had a genie and three wishes, and then we'd use two, and we had one wish left, and somebody ratted us out and lied about us, and then we got, you know, to the point that we're going to go with gallows, and we know it. And we have one more wish. Are we going to use that wish for that guy? I would like to say I would, but I wouldn't. Jesus did. His final action of power would be for the guy that put him on the cross. Because oftentimes we say it was Judas. Yeah, Judas ratted him out. But all Judas really did was tell him where he was. Judas never lied about him. Judas didn't arrest him. Judas didn't, I mean, Judas betrayed him for sure. But Judas ain't why he went to the cross. The high priest's servant is why he went to the cross. He was the one reporting everything. So that when they went to court and they had the list of charges, that's where it came from. And that's the one Jesus healed. His death on the cross would bring forgiveness to the entire world. Jesus knew that. He had told the disciples that. He was trying to tell all of us that. His death on the cross would be forgiveness for everybody. And in the final miracle, Jesus is displaying the truth that salvation and forgiveness would be for everyone, even that guy. Even that guy. He's, he told them, I'm going to the cross and it's to die for everybody's sins. And when Peter chopped that guy's ear off, Jesus saw he doesn't get it. He doesn't get it. That that guy is as valuable as Peter is to me. I'm getting ready to go on the cross to forgive them all. I have to show them I mean all. Even that guy. The final miracle was a chance for Jesus to display and teach them that salvation and forgiveness would truly be for all people. The offender, we, we see the offender as the enemy. He's the guy. You know, he's the one that we're going to point the finger at. Jesus just saw him as wounded. Jesus didn't see him as, as a threat. Jesus didn't see him. Why? Because Jesus knew there was a mission that God had and it was bigger and better than anything that was going on in the garden. That same fact is true for us now. No matter what people do to us, there's a bigger and better mission going on than anything that's happening in our garden. None of this should rattle us. 
We should never look at another human being as our offender. Because that's not how Jesus sees them. Jesus sees them as forgiven. Jesus sees them as worth healing. Jesus saw him as wounded. I also want to draw your attention to the only violence that occurs in both um, John and Luke. The difference in John and Luke is John names Peter. I think Luke just says one of the disciples. But otherwise, both of their accounts are pretty similar. Um, but I want you to notice that um, in, in the, the account of what happens here, the only violence that is perpetrated is done by a disciple. Not the offender. They hadn't even put cups on him yet. They hadn't chained him up. They hadn't touched him yet. And violence came from a disciple. From somebody who said they loved Jesus. That's what happens when we start looking at people as the offender instead of how Jesus sees them. Sometimes the church will perceive somebody as the enemy and we lash out. We defend our own honor. We defend our good Jesus. We're not going to let anybody you know, put a stain on the church. We're not going to let anybody challenge salvation. We're not going to let anybody challenge our faith. And, and we lash out at the enemy. We, we decide that anybody that doesn't believe how we believe is the enemy. We decide LGBTQ is the enemy. We decide... Um, I don't know what's the hottest thing right now. We decide we decide women with abortions are the enemy. We picket them. We decide that gay people are the enemy. We decide that women in clergy are the enemy. We decide that these people are a threat to what we believe, and so they're an enemy, and then we lash out. No, you can't come here. No, you can't benefit from here. No, I won't serve you. No, I have no food for you. No, I will not help you. You're a sinner going to hell. You're going to hell. You're going to hell. You're going to hell. That's what we do. Sometimes the church is the disciple that chops the other guy's ear off. Are they the offender? Maybe. I don't know what they're doing to you personally. But you're not supposed to see them like that. You're supposed to see them as wounded. We're all wounded. Let's just be honest. We've got something going on. Jesus heals those people, showing the disciple or the church that this is not the course of action he condones. This miracle was saying, I forgive everyone, but this is not what I want you to do on my behalf. Don't you dare hurt someone in my name. I don't care who they are. I don't care if it's the same guy that's going to crucify me. Don't you dare hurt him because I'm going to heal him. If you do, I'm going to heal him. And you're going to have to watch me do that. (laughs) And that's like eating crow, quite frankly. Jesus heals him. The church has to be very, very careful not to become the very thing that we're against. The disciples would have easily told anybody they were against violence. That Jesus was not there to lead a war. They knew that. And then in their fear to defend their faith, to defend their Jesus, they got violent. We get caught up in emotions. We get heated. And we stop seeing people the way Jesus sees people. And this miracle is trying to show us and remind us who Jesus sees and what he sees. The disciple, Peter, thinks that Jesus needs defending. In this world, a lot of people think Jesus needs defending. (laughs) He doesn't. He didn't then. And he does it now. Jesus is perfectly capable of taking care of himself, thankfully. Nobody was attacking Jesus. They didn't put him in chains. They just asked his name. Jesus is like, "Ah, me, it's me. I'm the one you're looking for. The, the, The discourse is occurring in this moment. We feel triggered sometimes when somebody claims to be agnostic or atheist or... Um, or, or something counterproductive to what we think the church is here for. And we see that as an attack on Jesus. Like they don't believe, like, like they think we're liars or that we're loony or because we believe in a zombie Jesus. Or, or you know, they, they, they take it to, and we, we think that's a personal problem. We have to defend the faith. We have to tell them Jesus is real. We have to tell them. And it becomes an attack on them when they just have said, I've had no experience with Jesus. <laughs> I wasn't raised in church. My parents didn't go to, I don't, I don't have a feeling one way or the other. I'm agnostic. I don't, I don't have a feeling. I don't know. And we begin to think that that's terrible. We begin to think that's an affront on us and we have to defend Jesus. I can't tell you how many times people will tag me on Facebook that um, some of will share something about there shouldn't be women pastors or they'll share something that's atheists or whatever. And somebody will, will tag me to get in the conversation in the comments. And every time I go in and I'm like, The gospel is supposed to be used as a weapon against Satan, not the brethren, and I refuse. I refuse to use scripture to make someone else feel small. I won't do it. That's not what it's for. I'm not going to use scripture to make someone else feel like their world has been rocked and then just leave them wherever they're at to sit in that. (laughs) I'm not going to use scripture. I'm not going to jump in this page, in this comment section. This is not the place to have a discussion. This should be one saying, I love you, Jesus loves you, and there's a place for you here. 
But they don't want me to say that. They want me to tell this person how they're wrong. They want me to tell this person using scriptures. I'm not doing it. That's not what it's for. And too often the church thinks Jesus needs defending when in truth, if we would just step back and say, Jesus wants to love you. He don't need defending. He's perfectly capable of doing it himself. Our response to cut off the ear has us acting like we think they're going to act. We decide they're going to act like that, so we're going to beat them to punch. <laughs> oh, it, it doesn't work. The miracle was to show us it doesn't work. Another revelation from the final miracle is everything can be an opportunity for your calling. This is hard for me to come by, and I'll be honest, some days today it's still hard for me to come by. <laughs> everything can be an opportunity for your calling. Jesus could have fed the disciples to wake them up. Remember, he went and, like, they kept falling asleep, and he's like, will you not tarry with me for an hour? One sure way to make people stay awake is to feed them. It just, people are awake if they're eating, and people like to eat. He could have fed them. He fed the 5,000. He absolutely could have fed the disciples. He didn't. He could have risen one more person from the dead on the way to the garden before the soldiers came. I mean, they'd seen Lazarus. They'd seen the little girl. I mean, they'd, Peter's mother-in-law. They'd seen him raise people. He could have done it one more time. Because for me, I think that's the biggest miracle, like on his earthly mission before the cross, was raising people from the dead, right? He could have done that. He didn't. He could have healed some way on the way to the garden. He didn't. The final miracle would be given to the lost. The one who didn't like him, the one who didn't love him, the one that didn't participate in worshiping him, the one that was worried about his downfall. The final miracle would be given to the lost. And that's not a coincidence. There's a message in that. He has called us to minister, all of us, whatever your individual calling is. We're all called to minister. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. We all have the Great Commission. We're all called to witness and to serve and to win the lost. That's just the universal call of the Christian. And if we reserve all of our goodwill and all of our blessings and all of our talents and all of our gifts for the saints, the lost will stay lost. If we have our revival services and we have our altar lined up and a healing service and people are falling out and jumping over pews and getting delivered, that's great. But there's a whole big wide world out there. Why are we telling them they have to come to us? Because Jesus never once said, come to me. He went to them. Lazarus was dead and they sent for him. Jesus, he's dead. And he came. She didn't pack Lazarus up and take him to where Jesus was. She didn't pack up all of her kids and make a basket and come and stay all night. They didn't do a bunch of worship and hoopla. And, and, and I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with that. I love a good holy rolling service. I was raised Pentecostal. I ain't nothing wrong with that at all. But what I'm saying is it's not required to do what we're called to do. And oftentimes we're like, well, it's uncomfortable outside of the walls of the church. It's uncomfortable to talk about Jesus in a grocery store aisle. It's uncomfortable. And if it comes up, it's uncomfortable for somebody to say, you know, I've been struggling with whatever. Maybe they have cancer. Maybe they have mental issues. Maybe, you know, they've been struggling with depression or something like that. It's very uncomfortable in the middle of Kroger to go, can I pray for you? And then pray for them there. Now, what we like to do is go, I'll put you on our prayer list. Because I don't want to be in public and let people see me pray for you. Jesus healed in front of the very people that didn't believe he could. That's his final miracle. Even in a moment when he was scared, he was anxious, he was worried, he was alone, he chose to try and reach the lost one more time. Now, they had free will, and they could have taken that miracle and changed their lives, like when um, Paul and Silas were chained and the jailhouse guy got saved and the jailer got saved. They could have had a, a turning point. They didn't, but they could have. Um, and, and that's the thing. If we don't see the result of the whole house getting saved, then we just don't do it again. It didn't make a difference. Sometimes it might not. But the bottom line is there's a message in that because that person now knows that somebody in this world has decided they're worth it. God forbid the day ever come that I get to heaven and God looks at me and says, you loved too much for shame. Right? Well, they're gay. They can't, they don't know anything about Jesus. They're, they're, they're gay. They're an abomination. I can't imagine that. I, I tell them to come in here and, and, and they worship with us and they serve with us and they do our ministries with us and they whatever and we have great relationships, great friendships and we eat across the table. I can't imagine that when I go to heaven, God's going to look at me and go, I cannot believe you love those people. How dare you love people? I, I don't think we're going to get in trouble for that. Because you know what? It's not up to me to decide if they're sinful or not. Nowhere in scripture does the Bible say, 
call out somebody's sin. Now, the church likes saying that a lot. You've got to call out sin. The Bible never tells us to do that. Why? Because it ain't my job. I'm not the judge. Now, can I read the scripture and have scripture say, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that? Of course. But is it my job to tell someone else they're the ones doing wrong? Absolutely not, because there's probably a beam in my own eye. Maybe not in that area, but somewhere in my life, I'm not getting it right, right? We're not supposed to do that at all. We're supposed to love them. And if, if what they're doing is wrong, our love, when we reach out to them and they receive the transformative power of Christ, he will change them from the inside out. And I don't even have to worry about if it's sin or not. Because he will change it if it needs to be changed. I'm not going to change it. I can sit them in a room and I can counsel them for 20 minutes and I can counsel them for 20 years and I can give them all the scriptures in the world, but that's not going to change them. Jesus has to change them and they're not going to get Jesus if I refuse to take advantage of every opportunity to give them Jesus. We're supposed to give them Jesus and nothing less. But we've decided that because they're lost, because they're the bad guy, they're the offender, they are not worthy of our precious Jesus. When they are the exact people Jesus wants. We forget we were those people. The final miracle all summed up, of course, it was a supernatural healing. I definitely don't want to take away the power from that. I definitely don't want to take away the excitement from that and, and the impact of a supernatural miracle, of course. Um, the message of all the miracles is that we have that same power, right? Is that Jesus gave the same power to us. He passed the authority to us. Um, but past that is... We have to heal and minister to the offenders, which means forgiveness and mercy for everybody. While they're putting the knife in your back, you have to forgive and, and offer mercy. You have to say, it hurts, like physically, ow, and it hurts my heart, ow, I don't like it, it hurts. But Jesus, his very last thing he did was ask me to love you anyway. <laughs> and for all the things that he's done for me, I can do that one thing. That, that one thing is hard. And maybe you won't get it right every time. But I'm telling you, if you it, it's, it's a mindset. Forgiveness isn't always um, easy, but it's a decision. You can decide to forgive someone even if in your heart you really haven't. I'm going to treat them like they're forgiving because God's going to work on my heart. God's going to heal me. God's going to minister. It's hard to forgive somebody when you're unhealed. They can't heal you anyway. You're, forgiving them is not going to heal you. Not forgiving them is not going to heal you. Your healing is going to come from God. So forgive them and you and God work on you. Treat them as if there was no transgression. And you and God will make you better. He has been faithful 100% of the time to pull you through. We don't defend Jesus because then we become exactly what we're against. We become the offender. <laughs> we become the violent one. We become the one that withholds love. And we have to seize the opportunity to minister even if it's scary. Even if our time is short, even if we know if we only have a few minutes, we have to seize that opportunity. We can't keep waiting for the perfect place and the perfect time. We're not always going to get it. It may be when you're busy. It may be when you're scared. Maybe you're overcome because your own life is not where it should be, is not where you want it to be. We have all been in positions where we've gotten bad diagnoses or, or family has been very sick or past even. In those moments when we're focused in on ourselves, we miss opportunities. Jesus could have been focused in on his fear. He, he could have remained in prayer with God. Because that's probably what I would have done, I'll be honest, in that moment. The whole way. I might have known I was going to do it, but the whole way I'd be talking to God because I'd be freaking out. There's no way I'd be able to do it without talking to God. And Jesus talked to the Father, and then he was like, I'm not going to talk to God all the way to the cross because I have work to do. I'm going to talk to him before so I can get prepped, so he can heal me, so that he can give me courage, so that he can give me strength to endure. I'm going to do the work. And then me and God are going to meet back up. Because <laughs> he's with me. Whether we're chatting or not, he's with me. Right? He hasn't, he's not gone anywhere. So the final miracle is a beautiful miracle in a supernatural healing. It's, it's a fun look into Peter knowing that after three years he was just as violent as he was the day he met Jesus. <laughs> it's comforting for us to know when our process takes longer than we think it should. Right? When I look at myself and I think you should be further along in your walk with Jesus by now. It's comforting to know that Peter was literally with him every second of every day for three years and still chopped some dudes there. <laughs> I'm not so bad, right? It's nice to have these little reminders, but more importantly, the final miracle reminds us there is no enemy. Every second of every day is an opportunity, and love should be the first thing we do to everybody. Lord, we are thankful for opportunities to demonstrate your love. God, I pray that you give us opportunities to demonstrate your love. I pray that you show us Lord, that you help um, trigger in us. Lord, compel us and draw us to the lost. 
Lord, let us see opportunities. Let us seize those opportunities. And God, plant the seed, whether we see it in that moment or we see it years down the road. Lord, I believe that there is a purpose to every meeting. I believe there is a, a meaning to every conversation. Lord, nothing is by coincidence or happenstance, but God, it is by your divine design. And so, Lord, I pray we begin to look for and to see those moments, Lord, and that we take hold of them. Let us be a witness to the lost. Let us be a witness to the saved. Lord, let there be no difference in how we treat the lost versus the saved, the sinner or the saint. Lord, let us see people the way you see people. Let us see hearts and not actions, God, because we are not what we do. We are who we love. We are yours. We are chosen. We are being made righteous and we are being made perfect. And God, that is the salvation. That is the miracle that we want to give to the rest of the world. Lord, let us do that effectively as we remember the point and the messages of the miracles. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.